So, uh, good morning to everybody. Mm, welcome to this session on uh, learning and control. I'm the chair. I'm Giordano Pola from, uh, mm, from the University of L'Aquila. I'm associate professor there. And so I would like to invite the first speaker, uh, who is Marco Forgione, who is going to give a talk on a contribution that is entitled uh, DynoNet, a neural network ar architecture for learning dynamic systems. So please, Marco, go ahead. Okay, I start uh, sharing uh, the screen. Before mm -hmm. you, you see my screen, everybody? Yeah, I can okay. see it. <laughs> okay, thanks uh, for uh, your introduction. Uh, uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, a new neural network architecture that we have been developing at uh, ITSIA uh, together with Dario Piga, who's also at ITSIA. Uh, we call it DynoNet, and it's a neural network architecture tailored for uh, learning dynamical systems. So uh, the common uh, architectures for, uh, for learning uh, dynamical models for system identification, we would say in the control fields, are uh, the following uh, recurrent neural networks and 1D convolutional neural networks. Recurrent uh, neural networks, uh, in essence, are uh, uh, basically state space, discrete time state space models where the, the state and the output mappings are represented uh, as uh, feed forward neural networks. And in this sense, they, are, uh, they have a very high capacity, they can represent basically any system which has a state space representation because a, a neural network are general function approximator. On the other end, they are uh, kind of uh, hard to train. Uh, first, uh, the, it's difficult to parallelize because uh, when you simulate a recurrent neural network, you are uh, simulating uh, a different uh, uh, neural network for each time steps. And this has to be done sequentially. You cannot fully explain parallel hardware, or at least you have some limitations. And then there are some numerical issues in training recurrent neural networks, it's like exploding uh, vanishing gradients. Not gonna talk about the details today, but uh, there are. Uh, we have then uh, 1D convolutional neural networks. In these uh, networks, uh, the dynamics is represented uh, by convolution. So basically by fi uh, finite impulse response blocks. Uh, and uh, in this sense, the they have a lower capacity. They are built as interconnection of FIR and static nonlinearities. They are basically nonlinear FIRs. And also they may require several parameters. If we have a system with a long memory, we have to store basically what uh, in the linear case is uh, the impulse response. Um, but they also have advantages. Uh, training is fully parallelizable and the numerically training is also well behaved. So we have mutual advantages and disadvantages. Today we are introducing DynoNet, that is a, a structure that is a little bit in between. It's uh, in DynoNet uh, we include the rational transfer functions as basic building blocks. So in some sense it extends significantly the 1D convolutional neural network by allowing an infinite impulse response because we have a rational transfer function. But still they can be trained efficiently by, being, by plain back propagation, that is the, the standard algorithm in training uh, neural networks. And uh, the work has also a strong relationship with what is known in uh, system identification as block-oriented modeling. So block-oriented models are also built as an uh, interconnection of uh, uh, linear dynamical systems, called them G, and the static nonlinearities F. But in the literature, just uh, some Pretty simple structures have been studied, uh, like uh, the Wiener, that is a connection GF, Hammerstein FG, Wiener Hammerstein GFG. There is some slightly more complex uh, architectures here, but not much more than that. And even more, the training has to be performed with a specialized algorithm that often requires the user to provide the analytic expression of uh, the gradients for trading. That it's kind of cumbersome somehow to, to come up with an analytic expression of uh, gradients. It's error prone and limits the applicability. So DynoNet uh, uh, can be seen as a generalization of uh, block-oriented models that allows arbitrary interconnection of uh, MIMO blocks, linear blocks, uh, linear dynamical blocks, G, 
transfer functions and static non-linearities non f. But uh, perhaps more importantly, we, we train them with a unified approach where uh, at the basis there is plain bracket propagation for uh, computing the gradients. So we can define easily more complex structures and have uh, the gradients ready made. Um, loosely speaking, uh, the connection of uh, G, transfer function, and F nonlinearity is seen as a neuron of uh, our architecture. So, as a, a static uh, linear block and uh, a static nonlinearity is the, uh, the classic neuron in uh, feed forward neural networks. So, there is a challenge here uh, how to do back propagation through a transfer function function. We, we found no hint, no reference uh, to that in the literature. And also that the transfer function is not a ready made uh, block of uh, deep learning uh, frameworks. So probably we thought nobody has uh, ever developed this uh, block uh, before for uh, back propagation. So we, we did it ourselves in this uh, work. And uh, here I present uh, how to do it with a CISO transfer function for simplicity, but uh, it can be extended. So a CISO transfer function uh, transforms uh, an input sequence, sequence uh, u in an output y, and it has numerator, denominator coefficients, p and a, using a standard notation, standard transfer function. For our purpose, g is also a vector operation. Uh, it's better seen as a vector operation that transforms uh, an input sequence u, of length t, to a uh, another finite uh, input sequence uh, y of uh, length t using also the coefficients vector a and b. And our goal in this uh, work was to provide g with uh, the a correct and efficient backpropagation behavior so that it can be integrated in deep learning software and we can build uh, all the structures we want. But to do so, we have to tell a little bit about uh, back propagation. Uh, so in back propagation based training, the user typically defines a computational graph by interconnecting blocks that individually support back propagation. So they know how to individually how to do back propagation. And there are two phases. Uh, so the, the, the graph produces a loss and the objective of course is to minimize the loss. The loss could be like the simulation error norm. In the forward pass, there are two, two phases, the forward and the backward pass. In the forward pass, the loss is computed. And so starting from uh, the input, each block receives a, well, each block receives an input and they transform it to an output. This is a representation of a computational graph, but in particular, we show the transfer function here, it has an input, it produces an output. Overall, there will be a loss, but we're not interested in uh, all the steps. We, we just need to implement the transfer function here. So the forward pass for a transfer function is kind of uh, simple. It's just a filtering operation that we have seen before. The, the transfer function has to produce y given u and a b. And the computational cost is also linear in the number of time steps. That here, it's simple, both uh, theory and implementation. But things get a little bit more tri tricky in the backward pass. In the backward pass, we want to compute derivatives of the loss with respect to all variables that uh, we need for training. Here, I use this notation that to compact the notation, x bar is the derivative of the loss with respect to the variable x. The procedure now, it starts from the end of the graph, actually, because the only thing we know is that uh, the derivative of the loss with respect to itself is one. And from there, we go backward to all the other nodes. So each operator, the transfer function in particular, has to be able to push back those derivatives from uh, its outputs to its inputs. And G in particular derives, uh, receives uh, uh, this Y bar that is the derivatives of the loss with respect to the transfer function output. And it has to compute A bar, B bar, U bar, all the, the derivatives that may be needed. And it's basically an application of uh, the chain rule. We, we know uh, the derivative of Y with respect to U and we, we combine it with a derivative uh, uh, of uh, the loss with respect uh, to, to Y that is U bar. It's an application of uh, the chain rule. But uh, we have to apply it in the smartest way possible to minimize the number of computations that we perform. 
then we, we can get uh, an efficient uh, implementation that, that, that makes it really useful in practice. I make uh, just an example here uh, to get a feel of which kind of computations we are doing. How to compute the U bar derivative of the loss with respect to U from a Y bar derivative of the loss with respect to Y that is given. We, we, the block uh, receives it from other blocks. It's an application of uh, the chain rule in essence, Y bar at uh, an instant tau is a derivative of the loss with respect to U at instant tau. And it's the summation of a derivative of the loss with respect to Y time T uh, times derivative of uh, the, the, the output with respect uh, to the input at uh, time uh, uh, tau. So it's equal to this summation, summation of Y bar T that is given times the derivative of the output of a transfer function with respect to its input. But this is uh, for a transfer function is simply the impulse response coefficient at a certain time t minus tau. This uh, formula above uh, is also equivalent to a cross correlation. So we are saying that u bar, that is what we need, is the cross correlation between uh, the impulse response and uh, the y bar that is a given vector for us of self length t. This operation, however, has a cost uh, that is quadratic in t because uh, y bar has length t and g is uh, potentially uh, infinite. So the, the cost to compute on the index we need is t squared, which is not that good, but we can do a little bit better, uh, actually much better. We can do it linearly in time. We, we just recognize it just a trick of signal processing that uh, cross correlation with uh, an impulse response is equivalent to filtering uh, through the filter in reverse time and then flipping again the re result. It's just the trick you, you could derive this. Uh, but this is very important for us because then we can compute a U bar, the same thing uh, that we need uh, in a time that is linear in T because filtering through a transfer function, basically it's, uh, it has a linear cost in time and flipping is not such a high cost. Okay, there are similar tricks uh, to do all the derivatives also with respect to the coefficients A, B. We, we have a paper, it's under review, but uh, it's also an archive if you're curious about uh, those details. And we also did not just uh, compute stuff on paper, we provided an uh, implementation of, uh, the, uh, of uh, a differentiable transfer function. So transfer function that can be embedded in deep learning in a very popular deep learning framework, PyTorch. Here we have just a very simple example, this DynoNet in the, at the left. It's actually, it's a simple one. It corresponds to what it will be called the parallel wiener Hammerstein plus uh, a direct uh, term from, uh, from input to output. There is also this direct uh, linear path from input to output. It's loosely inspired uh, to a residual network, but it's just an example, a simple one. And uh, having defined the, the block, uh, building this model in PyTorch, it's really straightforward. I define a linear transfer function with one input and four outputs. It's basically correspond to the first filter bank here, and then a static non-linearity four by three. This is a feedforward neural network. Then a three by one uh, transfer function, and then the, the CISO transfer function. And then I just define how they are interconnected and I have a, I have the model and I have uh, the derivatives ready-made and I can train by back propagation, everything. We applied uh, the, some slightly different DynoNet uh, networks uh, to benchmark uh, from uh, the system identification uh, community. So those are popular benchmark available on uh, this website and many methods are tested uh, uh, against those benchmarks in the literature. We obtained uh, pretty good results. They compare well with other uh, black box identification uh, techniques. And, but it's also very easy to put in place. Not much uh, hyperparameter tuning uh, was done. Uh, with, with, with simple networks, we obtained uh, satisfactory results. We were pretty happy about uh, those results. Concluding, uh, we have presented a new architecture for uh, neural networks 
tailored uh, to sequence modeling, so to the to modeling dynamical sequences. The highlights is that we extended the 1D convolutional uh, with blocks that uh, have an infinite uh, impulse uh, response instead of uh, a finite impulse response of uh, the 1D convolutional. It also extended significantly the block-oriented framework because we allow arbitrary interconnections. And uh, more importantly, we, we provide a training technique that is based on plain back propagation at cost linear in time. We don't require a custom uh, algorithms, uh, software, or uh, uh, specification of uh, the derivatives uh, by hand. We are now working uh, at uh, techniques to, to do estimation and control for systems described by DynoNet networks, but also these controllers uh, could be DynoNet uh, networks. And uh, another point is uh, how to do system analysis, uh, model uh, reduction uh, on DynoNet networks. We could exploit uh, linear tools, uh, for instance, to inspect uh, those uh, MIMO transfer functions and uh, reduce them if uh, an SVD of uh, the transfer function shows that uh, uh, it's kind of over uh, parameterized. We can use the linear tools uh, to inspect uh, at least uh, the, the linear blocks in our uh, architecture. And this is uh, the end uh, of uh, my talk. If you have questions, I will be pleased uh, to answer. Uh, you can also send me an email later on. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, for your very nice presentation. Are there any questions? Uh, I remember you that you can just write down some questions also on the chat. In the meanwhile, I'm looking for the other speakers of the session, which, however, are still missing. I have seen uh, among the attendees, uh, Vittorio de Iulis. I was wondering if Vittorio is going to present the, the fourth contribution. Ciao Giordano. Eh, Ciao Vittorio, buongiorno. Buongiorno, dovrebbe presentarla Francesco. Ok, quindi dovrebbe arrivare fra un po' in mano. Sì, adesso magari lo sollecito se non c'è, io chiaramente non vedo la lista dei... dei eh, perché sì, tu non puoi vedere, sì, hai ragione. Adesso lo sollecito. Sì, uh, and also I need the, the speaker for the fifth contribution that is uh, about deep reinforcement learning for autonomous robot navigation in unknown environments by Devo, Dionigi, Mezzetti, Costante, and Valigi. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, who are you? Alessandro, Alessandro Devo. Alessandro Devo, perfetto. Thank you. So you are the the other speaker that's great yes. in the meanwhile i would like to ask uh, so we have one minute left but anyway i would like to ask alessandro giuseppe to just share the screen and uh, in one minute he can start there is a question from uh, maria domenica ah there is a question from maria domenica Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. We oh, can. wonderful. Big, um, thank you, Giordano. Uh, just a very short question to Marco. I found the presentation very, very interesting. Um, could you um, understand what are the advantages in uh, some special cases of having uh, a transfer function instead of a static system? Is there any uh, particular example where you that you that you have been able to uh, uh, to work out so the advantages of uh, dynamic with respect to which kind of architecture uh, well i imagine it is uh, as far as i understand it is a generalization of uh, 
uh, of some more static uh, mm -hmm. approximation, right? right? So, uh, of course, I can see the advantage uh, theoretically, and uh, I, I like it very much. Uh, I just wanted to know if you could apply this to, to some special cases and, and understand uh, if the dynamics, uh, what the dynamics can bring. Well, if, you, if you're modeling a dynamical system, I, uh, I would say that a static uh, feed-forward neural network is not uh, the ideal tool. Uh, the, the tools in the literature are uh, recurrent neural networks and uh, uh, 1D convolutional. Uh, with respect to 1D convolutional, we, we can save an, a lot of parameters say, if you have a long memory, because we we store in a transfer function uh, compactly along uh, uh, representation of, uh, of something that could be long, like an impulse response. I don't know if it answered your yeah. question. Yeah. Which... Yes. Thank you very much, Marco. Thanks you for your question, Maria. Thank you, Marco. <laughs> so let's go okay. to the next speaker. Uh, Alessandro, please share the screen. Okay, thank you. So, uh, okay, so let me first introduce you. So, um, the title of this contribution is Deep Reinforcement Learning Based Control for Chance Constraint Systems by Alessandro Giuseppe and Antonio Pietra Bissa. Please, Alessandro, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So, as you mentioned, uh, this presentation uh, will cover the results of a recent contribution that uh, appeared in uh, IEEE Control System Letters with the same title of the presentation by myself and by Professor Antonio Preto Bissa from the University of Rome, La Sapienza. So um, to give a brief outline of the presentation, we will start uh, with a problem description and introduction to deep reinforcement learning for control problems. Then we will give some preliminaries on lexicographic reinforcement learning. And uh, then we will discuss the results related to lexicographic deep reinforcement learning. We will then present a validation example and draw the conclusion and highlight the future works of this research. So um, deep reinforcement learning is a branch of model-free control that uh, rose to popularity over the past few years. The most impactful contribution is probably playing Atari with deep reinforcement learning that appeared in 2013. In uh, this paper, the authors proposed the DQN, an algorithm that stands for uh, deep Q networks, uh, according to which, uh, utilizing which they were able to train uh, several different uh, autonomous agents able to play some Atari video games. Here we are on the screen, a few examples. Following, uh, um, in the following few years, uh, the research interest in this new branch of reinforcement learning grew and uh, several classical control problems were addressed by it. So a lot of results from classic reinforcement learning theory were translated in this new framework and several new applications were explored. Here on the screen, we have a few examples from the robotics domain uh, worker problems and optimal fuel usage. Uh, one limitation of uh, deep reinforcement learning control system is that uh, in general, they do not offer any guarantees on the performance or um, the uh, uh, satisfaction of uh, constraints imposed to the systems under control. So uh, this is uh, a problem in a real world application because uh, there is a perceived sense of uh, instability, even if uh, reinforcement learning controllers are starting to behave uh, uh, in a, a very good way in certain domains. And uh, this work will focus on a, a constraint control problem, in particular a chance constraint control system. A controller that satisfies a chance constraint uh, uh, control system and makes so uh, it controls the system in such a way that uh, uh, the state of the system remains in a desired region with a certain probability threshold. So, for example, we may desire to control the pressure inside of a tank 
so that uh, it is below a certain critical value for um, 95% of times or something like that. Chance constraints are typically found in stochastic control theory and also paired with the model predictive control because one may wish to exploit uh, some uh, stochastic knowledge on uh, the disturbances uh, and uh, characteristics of the system under control in a predictive way. Another application of this kind of control, uh, of constraint, sorry, is found in economic MPC and the likes. And in this setting, we may allow our system to evolve outside of uh, its operative region for a short amount of time if the performance or economic payoff is uh, worth it for, for the controller. So, um, sorry, apologize. Um, in general, reinforcement learning can be applied to uh, constrained control systems. And the typical solution is um, to design some barrier or potential functions to steer the state of the system away from some undesired regions. Alternatively, uh, one can design a multi-objective optimization problem and then propose a, a Lagrangian-like approach with some tunable weights to uh, scale the various objectives. An alternative solution to those two approaches is the lexicographic approach. The basic idea behind the lexicographic optimization is the following. Uh, we order the constraints according to their priority and relevance to the system. And then we associate to each one of them a separate cost function. The lexicographic paradigm states that uh, we select the action to minimize the primary or original cost function only if the system state is so that uh, uh, we are able to assure the meet, the meet of all the considered constraints. Uh, if some constraints are violated, then the controller will select the action that minimizes the cost associated to the most critical violated constraint. So uh, the lexicographic paradigm allows us to introduce the concept of lexicographic optimality. And we can say that uh, a solution is better than another solution if uh, it either satisfies more constraints or if the number of satisfies constraint uh, is equal, uh, then the cost of the most critical violated constraint uh, is lower. Of course, if both solutions satisfy all the constraints, uh, the better solution is the one associated with the lower primary cost. So um, it is possible to introduce the concept of lexicographic reinforcement learning, according to which uh, um, the goal is to find an agent or a controller able to attain a policy or a control law that is able to find a lexicographically optimal uh, control strategy. So uh, to attain this result uh, as customary in uh, reinforcement learning problems, uh, the controller has to learn the so-called state action value function Q. Uh, the function Q is very important in uh, the framework of reinforcement learning as it gives uh, also the name to Q-learning, which is probably the most famous algorithm. Uh, the state action value function uh, is nothing more than uh, an approximation of the expected total discounted cost, uh, starting from a given state and action and then following the current uh, policy. So the idea behind lexicographic reinforcement learning is, as I said, to design some more uh, cost function, some additional cost function associated to the various chance constraints that uh, our system is subject to. And then we will learn uh, the value function Q associated to each of the various costs. Um, in fact, it is shown on the paper with some trivial manipulations that the chance constraints can be imposed to our system in the following form. We have a simple inequality. On the right hand, we have the probability threshold of um, that we want to constrain our system to. 
scaled by a factor that depends on the discount factor that uh, characterizes the optimization problem. Uh, the discount factor weights future rewards uh, against uh, current rewards. And uh, on the, the left side, we have, of course, uh, the state action value function. So, um, so with the, some simple idea uh, being uh, giving a unitary cost uh, if a constraint is violated under the current control law and zero otherwise, it is possible to show that the state action value function will capture the probability of having the system evolve inside, uh, actually outside in this form, the desired region. So in lexicographic deep reinforcement learning, we will train uh, C plus one critic networks where the critic networks is nothing more than an approximator of the value function. And the number C is the number of constraints. The plus one comes from the presence of the originally primary uh, cost. So the sketch of the algorithm is the following. We train the various uh, deep reinforcement learning agents, so the various neural networks, to solve an environment in which we consider only a single cost function, the one associated to the network. And this training can be done in parallel since the various uh, neural networks do not interact with one another since they consider only their own cost function. After the training of all the neural networks is completed, then we can select uh, in a lexicographic fashion, which is the best action to take. And to do so, uh, we, following, uh, we can follow the lexicographic action selection uh, procedure that I sketched here. And basically, uh, we identify the set of action that satisfies the first constraint that uh, we have, so the one with the highest priority. We then forward uh, this set of actions to the second constraint and evaluate uh, which actions in that set satisfy also the second constraint. We can iterate this procedure up until the point we are in one of the following two cases. If no action satisfies the current constraint, then we have to select one from the set that satisfied all the previous ones. And um, we pick the one associated with the lower cost uh, of the uh, cost, uh, cost function associated to the violated constraint. So it is uh, simply a direct translation of the concept of lexicographic optimality. Of course, if uh, all constraints are satisfied for a set of actions, then we can select over that set uh, the action associated with the lower primary cost. And here we can see a pseudocode of the algorithm. On the left, we have uh, uh, the standard DQN algorithm, basically, without uh, any particularly interesting modification. We can highlight the presence of an epsilon greedy action selection procedure, since all reinforcement learning agents have to explore the environment and find a good trade-off with knowledge exploitation. And uh, also, uh, a little below that, uh, we can highlight the actual training process where we train uh, the network, uh, utilizing the concept of uh, experience replay and experience buffer or memory buffer, which is commonly found in deep reinforcement learning approaches. On the right, we have the pseudocode for the lexicographic uh, reinforcement learning agent, which is nothing more than the procedure to select uh, the action and the, the critic network uh, considered uh, that I sketched before. As a benchmarking uh, solution to give a validation example, we consider the classic cart pole system, which was introduced by Professor Barto and beca became one of the most uh, utilized benchmarking uh, environment for enforcement learning. And we modify it uh, um, in both objectives and constraints. We modify the original objective, which is was keeping the pole balanced by adding the fact that we also want to minimize the control effort. And then uh, we introduce two chance constraints uh, that are related to keeping the angle and the position of the cart 
in a certain region for 95% of times. This percentage is uh, arbitrary, but uh, we will see that it can be changed also in real time. So it is not uh, something that uh, enters the training procedure. Here we can see the first agent that we trained. This one was trained to minimize the control effort and uh, of course to keep, to keep the pool balanced. And uh, we can see that it is not concerned with the uh, oscillation in the pool or in the cart position, since uh, it is not aware of the presence of the two uh, constraints, uh, nor their objectives. Sorry, but this agent over here, uh, okay, this agent over here was trained to uh, cope with the objective related to the angle constraint which is uh, the most uh, critical one. And we can see that the pole oscillates uh, a lot less than in the previous case, but the position of the cart still uh, begins to diverge in uh, during the last few time steps. This agent uh, uh, deals with the constraint related to the position control. And we can see that it utilizes uh, uh, the control effort in a much more significant way. And uh, the pole is not uh, uh, perfectly balanced. Actually, it oscillates quite a bit. So here we visualize the resulting lexicographic agent that uh, takes the characteristics of the previous three uh, controllers. So the pole is uh, better balanced. The cart doesn't diverge. And overall, the force consumption is very limited. Here we have some uh, numerical quantitative results, uh, average over 100 runs. We can see that uh, the performance is in line with the behavior that we showed before. And also well, here we have uh, a couple more agents. The fourth line is, uh, sorry, actually the fifth line is related to another lexicographic agent that was given a, a more uh, um, uh, a higher uh, degree of freedom. So it had to control the position and the constraint for only 15% of times. And as I mentioned, this change in the probability threshold does not impact the training since it answers only in the action selection procedure. The last line uh, that we report is a benchmarking uh, agent, which was trained in a multi-objective fashion. And uh, it has similar performances, but at the expenses of a much greater control effort. So to conclude, the proposed uh, control strategy involves several different, uh, uh, different enforcement learning controllers, uh, and also provides a procedure to combine them to obtain a lexicographically optimal control strategy. The future works are related to the extension to the continuous control domain and to implement a better approximating value function solutions such as uh, TD3 or other state-of-the-art solutions. So here you have my contacts and of course I'm available to answer all your questions. Thank you, Alessandro, for your very nice presentation. Uh, we have time for a short question.
Okay, <clears throat> let's thanks again, Alessandro. So uh, I can see also Francesco, thank you. Um, the next talk is give, given by myself. I'm going to share the screen. Hope, hopefully it works. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So I'm trying to enlarge it, but my PC seems not working properly. Okay, anyway, so good morning to everybody. So uh, uh, as I told you, my name is Giordano Pola. This is a joint work with uh, my PhD student, Tommaso Masciulli, and my colleagues, Elena De Santis and uh, Maria Domenica Di Benedetto. All of us are from uh, uni the University of L'Aquila. So this is a paper, uh, a contribution, sorry, on um, um, data-driven control design uh, of uh, radar general class of systems that I'm going to introduce uh, in a while, where specifications are expressed in terms of regular languages. So this is the outline of the presentation. So at the beginning, I will spend a few words introducing the general framework where we move on. Then I will formulate the control problem. I will provide some slides describing at a high level the solution to the control problem that we consider. I will spend a few words also some, um, to some additional results that we have found an example of application in the end, some, some concluding remarks. Okay, as uh, you might know, there is a very uh, growing in interest from uh, many research areas, as for example, control systems, computer science, telecommunications, uh, on uh, data-driven approaches for uh, monitoring and controlling complex systems, uh, as also you have seen in the previous to uh, talks of this session. So um, our contribution is detailed in these four bullets. So um, again, we consider an approach based on uh, data um, on data for the control of this class of system that we term apps as systems where specifications are expressed in terms of regular languages. These systems we consider uh, have a known structure and we are not going to use identification techniques to understand the behavior of this of the system the uh, information pattern that we consider for the control design is given in terms of a finite set of experiments that are collected offline on the plant and then we are going to also to give some results concerning maximality convergence, adaptivity of the controller as the experiment grows. So what a abstract system is. So we start from these general definitions uh, in the same spirit of classical notions given by Zader, Hubert, and et cetera. So we start with a set of uh, the time set that is given by this calligraphic key that is uh, described by the pairs T1, T2 integers, such that one is less than T2, then I'm going to denote by calligraphic U the set of input values and by calligraphic U raised T1, T2, the set of input functions. Um, calligraphic X is the set of state values and calligraphic X raised T1, T2 is the set of state functions. Given this preliminary definition, I can describe my apps as system, as you can see in equation one, just as a uh, relation uh, P that is a subset of all possible 
uh, pairs of input and uh, state functions. Of course, I'm going to place some basic, very basic assumptions on, uh, very basic, let's say some basic assumptions on this uh, relation in equation one. In particular, we are going to assume that uh, it enjoys the properties to be suffix uh, and concatenation closed. Uh, we assume causality, time invariance, determinism, and also for later purposes, we are going to assume that the set of states of my absolute system is endowed with a metric that is denoted as uh, bold, bold D. Then I'm going to denote by X zero, the set of initial states of the plant, as you can see in equation, in equation two. So for later purposes, uh, I'm going also to recall the notion of a transition system that is described as equation three, where X is the set of states, X zero is the set of initial state, U is the set of input labels or inputs. That arrow represent the transition relation. X sub M is the set of max states, Y is the set of outputs, H is the output function. Uh, we will use also uh, a standard notation to describe a transition of my transition system as with the notation as in equation four, meaning that starting from X by applying label U, I jump to state X prime, okay? The evolution of a transition uh, system is given, is captured by the notion of state prime that is basically just a sequence of uh, transitions, as you can see in equation five, uh, such that, of course, X zero is an initial state of my transition system. Then I'm going to say that this is, is symbolic if X and U are finite sets and it is metric if the set of outputs Y is equipped with, with a metric. So we are going to use this formalism of transition systems as a um, unifying framework uh, to model uh, abstract systems, controllers, and also specifications. Okay. So indeed, the controller is given in, in equation six and is given, in fact, in terms of a, of a transition system, as you can see. So when uh, we uh, make the interaction between the plant and the controller, we obtain this control plan that is denoted as P C, and it is basically described as the collection of pairs UX belonging to the plant, where the control input U in equation seven is such that it equals, you see, U of T equal U sub T, where this U sub T is as in equation eight and is just the collection of input labels in a state run of the controller. Same, okay? Okay, uh, we have described, so the plant that is given uh, in terms of abstract systems, we have described the controller. Now we have to describe the specification. So the specification is just um, given in terms of a regular language that is defined over an alphabet uh, that is called here as a calligraphic A that is in turn a finite subset of the set of states of the plant. I recall that a regular language is just a language that can be represented by means of a symbolic transition system. Symbolic transition system uh, that I recall is just a transition system with a finite set of states and a finite set of inputs. Here I'm going also to give a very classical example in the context of cyber physical systems that is a classical reach avoid specification in the sense that I want to start from a set of initial states I, I want to reach my target set T, and in doing this, I want to avoid an obstacle that is denoted by capital, capital O, okay? So we have described 
uh, all the ingredients to, uh, we have described the plant, we have described the controller and the specification. Now we can uh, formulate indeed the problem, the control problem that we want to address. So I start with the plant and I'm going to consider a finite set of experiments that is just a collection of state, a finite collection of state, uh, uh, sorry, input state, functions in my plant, and I'm going to place a desired accuracy theta, which can be chosen as small as one wants. Then the idea here is to find the controller C and their relation subset of the set of the initial states of the plant and the controller, such that the closed loop system is going to satisfy my specification up to the accuracy theta, which means that the inequality 10 needs to be satisfied where we recall that D is the metric endowed on the set of states of the plant, okay? So the solution scheme is based on five steps, which now I'm going to briefly describe each by each. So let's start with, the, with step with step one. So in this step, what I'm going to do is the following. <clears throat> I start with my set of experiments uh, denoted by this capital Epsilon. And I'm going to encode all the information contained in the experiments uh, in the formalism of transition systems, as you can see in equation 13. I'm also giving here a very simple example. You see here, we have two trajectories in the left-hand side of the slide. Well, these two trajectories that are, are also uh, going to intersect in a common point can be easily formalized in terms of the transition system that you can see in the right-hand side of, of this slide, okay? This is the mathematical formulation of the transition system S of capital Epsilon, which I don't have time to talk about, but the idea is basically what I've shown in the previous, in the previous example. Next step consists in uh, starting from my specification Q, I want to encode the information contained in my specification, again, with the formalism of uh, transition systems. This can be always done simply because I'm assuming that Q is a regular language and hence by definition can be indeed represented by means of a symbolic transition system. Here again, I'm providing also an example, but I, okay, let's spend a few words. So in this example, I'm considering a specification in which I want to reach a symbol gamma, starting from a symbol alpha, uh, while only symbols beta are allowed. Well, if you uh, have a look to the transition system at the bottom of the slide, you can see I start from alpha, then I can either reach directly gamma or reach gamma, passing through the state that is beta and I can stay in beta anytime I want, okay? So this transition system indeed uh, represent the specification Q that I'm considering in, in this example. Step number three. So I've described who is S of capital Epsilon and also who is S sub Q. Then I'm going to construct a, a transition system C prime that is given by the approximate parallel composition between S of capital Epsilon and S sub Q. Well, this approximate parallel composition is basically a, an extension of the classical notion of uh, parallel composition that is well known in the community, for example, of uh, these given systems, but also in theoretical computer science, with the only difference uh, that here, uh, as you can see in equation 16, I'm going to uh, coupling states 
of the first transition system and on the, of the second transition system when the corresponding outputs are far away each other uh, for uh, a quantity that is less than or equal to this parameter theta, okay? Well, once I've constructed this uh, transition system C prime, I can construct the controller that is basically obtained just by uh, computing the so-called trim operator of C prime that what is the trim of this trim operator? This trim operator is just an operator that is going to remove from the original transition system states that are not accessible and states that are not co-accessible. On the basis of these controllers, here I can define as an equation 18, the relation R sub zero. Well, uh, our main contribution says that indeed the controller C in equation 17 and the controller and the relation, sorry, um, R zero in equation 18 solve R control. Then we address also some results. I need to, uh, I don't have too much time indeed. I'm also the chair, so I should respect the time. So very, very briefly, uh, we uh, have given some results concerning the maximality of the controller saying that our controller uh, enforce the largest part of the specification, which can be enforced. Then we, we have also provided a convergence result and also result concerning the adaptivity to the controller when the uh, set of, experience, uh, of experiments change. We applied our uh, results to a practical and very, very interesting application that is the one of the artificial pancreas. So this model is uh, taken from a paper by uh, some colleagues of us, uh, Alessandro Bori, Pasquale, Palumbo, Costanzo Manes, I don't remember if there are all, uh, also other, other authors. So here you can see G is the glucose concentration, I is the insulin concentration. The control input is given, uh, is represented by this variable U, that is the exogenous intravenous insulin delivery rate. And then you have this H that is defined in equation 20. Well, the control ob objective consists in driving state variables in safe region. So we consider this model just to generate the experiments from which we design the controller. Okay, so we consider uh, 20,000 experiments collected by simulating, again, P, that is, however, assumed to be unknown. In the plot, I show you both the specifications that are represented by these red vertical bars and asking so at each uh, time interval, no? For example, uh, the glycemia, but also the insulinemia to be in some desired intervals. And uh, as you can see from the functions uh, in blue, the specification is indeed satisfied. The thermal computation of uh, our Overall, our um, calculation is less than 2,000 um, seconds on a laptop with the standard characteristics. Okay. So concluding, we have given some results concerning um, a data-driven approach uh, for the control of this class of systems that we call abstract systems with specification expressed in terms of regular languages. We also provided some additional uh, results concerning maximality convergence and adaptivity. And we also presented uh, uh, some preliminary results on the application to the um, artificial pancreas. Thank you for your attention. Uh, in fact, we, uh, we have no time for, for, uh, for question because it's time to start with, with the next speaker. Okay. 
Uh, okay, so let me first introduce, let me do this. Okay, so let me introduce the uh, next contribution. So the next contribution is entitled Learning and Control of Smart Cities via Regression Trees. This is a paper from um, colleagues from L'Aquila, from Francesco Smara, who is going to present, Vittorio De Iuris, Giovanni Domenico Di Girolamo, and Alessandro Di Nocenzo. Please, Francesco, go ahead. Okay, uh, can you see the, the slides? Yeah, we do. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, hello everyone. I'm uh, Francesco Smarra from the University of L'Aquila. And in this presentation, I'll talk about learning and uh, control of smart cities via regression trees. That is a topic I'm working on together with uh, Alessandro Di Innocenzo, Vittorio Di Ulis, and Gianni Di Girolamo. And uh, I can start saying that the motivation behind this research as foundation within the Incipict project uh, that has been uh, founded four years ago with 5 million euros to increase the research effort in the context of uh, smart cities. The Tardo cities of the future that will be equipped with thousands of sensors uh, to collect all, uh, all sorts of data. In particular, the city of L'Aquila has been also selected to be one of the five cities in Italy to make experimentation of the 5G technology during the last three years. And 5G will be the key technology indeed to collect data from all the systems in a smart cities, in a smart city, and will provide the opportunity to have the real-time availability of them. So usually the systems we deal with uh, in a smart city uh, are complex systems, as for example, buildings, uh, and derive a mathematical model of such systems to set up optimal control strategies using standard techniques uh, is in general time consuming and prohibitive. So in the Incipict project, we focused uh, our attention exactly on this kind of systems. In particular, our aim is to use uh, machine learning algorithms to create mathematical models that can be used for control purposes, hence trying to create a bridge between machine learning and control, uh, leveraging the, the big availability of data that the 5G technology can provide us. Uh, in particular, at the beginning of the project, we initially focused on the problems of uh, energy minimization and climate control in buildings, and uh, on the active control and damage detection in uh, structures, while uh, recently uh, we extended our research line to other fields, such as peak load reduction in power converters uh, in the new paradigm of uh, software-defined de networking um, and also others. But due to time constraints in this presentation, we'll focus our attention uh, mainly on the methodology and on the first two cases. Uh, let us consider, for example, the case of building automation. At the University of L'Aquila, uh, we have uh, several test beds in this context, um, as the one that you see in the picture, that is the building of the human sciences department. So basically, the idea is, uh, given the data collected from the building, as for example, the power consumption, the room temperatures, weather condition, the control inputs, etc. Uh, we want to derive uh, a mathematical model to improve building performance and energy efficiency. So uh, in, in general, what, what is commonly done in this sense to derive a building model um, is to use physics laws. Um, but the point here is that modeling the dynamics of a real building uh, behavior can be quite hard. Since the structure to model can be quite complex, this can require an enormous amount of time and high costs to create the model. Uh, and also, each building is different. So once I created the model of a building, I cannot use the same model for another, bi another building. Mm, and also, when the model is created, the dynamics um, of the building can change over time due to the building age. So I have to start, to, to start over after a while with, um, with the identification procedure. So the point here is how to derive a simple enough mathematical model of the building in, all, in order to apply, for example, an MPC control strategy that can be solved in, uh, in real time. Um, well, in our research line, what we have done in the last years uh, and uh, within the Incipit project, and what we are currently doing is to modify machine learning algorithms in order to obtain mathematical models, also in the state space form, 
that can be used to set up efficient um, optimal control problem. Uh, in particular, the idea is to start from historical data set collected from the system uh, for from the sensor measurements uh, available in the in the systems, so measurements of the state, measurements of the uh, control inputs applied to the systems of the disturbance, um, and create several predictors using machine learning algorithms with the goal of predicting the behavior of the system over a finite horizon and use these models to set up an MPC problem that can be efficiently solved. Uh, for example, using standard quadratic programming. Uh, quadratic programming. Um, in the last year, we investigated several techniques in this sense, also in collaboration with other partners. For example, uh, in collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania, we investigated the case of the Gaussian processes or the neural networks in collaboration with the IMT of Luca. But uh, what I'm going to, to talk about uh, today uh, is about regression trees and random forests. This is because uh, on this methodology we spent most of, uh, of our time in the, in the last years, uh, always in collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania, and in particular we modified such algorithms uh, to define a modeling framework consisting on uh, switching models, uh, also in the state space form, uh, and use, so, and use uh, those models to, um, to set up an MPC problem that uh, could be solved with low computational complexity. But um, before going uh, into the details of this uh, methodology, I want just to give you an idea on how these regression trees work. In particular, consider, for example, a house where we can uh, measure the outsider temperature, the hour of the day, and the power consumption. What we want to do is to create a model to predict the power consumption of the house given the actual measurements of the outsider temperature and the hour of the day. So the regression trees algorithm, uh, in this case, we consider the CART algorithm, that is the first algorithm of the regression trees defined by Leo Breeman a while ago. Uh, this algorithm partitions the data set into regions uh, via binary splits following specific uh, optimization rules that are defined within the, the CART algorithm. Uh, and uh, once this, part this partition is created, the algorithm assigns to each region of the partition data set an estimated response that is the average of all the samples in each region. So this basically provides a statistical behavior of the system that is associated to the tree structure. For example, suppose that we uh, are before 2 p.m. and that the external temperature is lower than 20 degrees, then we can say that statistically we are consuming 400 megawatt of power. However, the problem with, the, with this type of regression tree structure, uh, as it is, uh, is, it, uh, is um, that uh, it cannot be used to set up an MPC problem. Uh, since we do, not, uh, we, do not, we do not have a model expression, a closed form expression to include in the, opti in the optimization problem, but only uh, a cost and value. So to address this issue, in our research, we modified the, the regression tree algorithm, as I'm going to illustrate now. So considering uh, an historical data set composed by samples collected from sensor measurements, uh, we can divide that uh, data set into an input data set X composed by the disturbance data and on the measurable states um, that are actually the output measured from the sensors. Uh, together with their regressive terms, and this output data set Y of the variable we want to predict, we consider the prediction of the state at the step J of the horizon. Uh, and as a first step, we use X and Y to train the regression tree structure. Um, so at this point, once the structure is created, we can use the samples in each leaf to set, to set up a classical uh, least square problem and fit an autoregressive model uh, to be assigned to each leaf. Now, the interesting part of this process is that all this is done offline. So in this way, we can create n different trees and use each of them to predict the system's dynamics over a predictive horizon and then set up an MPC problem. In particular, once these, uh, these structures are created, uh, in runtime, given the current measurement, we can narrow down to the corresponding leaves of the entries, select the, corre the correct models uh, at that time, and set up the MPC problem in this way uh, that can be solved efficiently using the standard programming. Uh, so we basically defined a switching system modeling framework where the switching rule is deterministically driven by the current measurement and the tree structure. 
uh, also without going much into the details, I can tell you that the same concept can be applied using random forests. That is an ensemble technique born to overcome variance and overfitting problems uh, regression trees uh, suffer of. In particular, they consist into an ensemble of trees uh, where the output of each forest is given by averaging out the output of the trees composing the forest. In this way, we obtain a model that, although more complex, has exactly the same structure uh, of the one we saw in the previous slide, but that in general provides a much better accuracy uh, in terms of modeling and also improved control performance. So at this point, once uh, the methodology was created, we decided to investigate its powerfulness um, on several benchmarks, most of them at the University of L'Aquila. In fact, for example, in the case of building automation, we have three test beds uh, in this sense to be used in the context of energy minimization and, uh, and climate control that we also, also together with other partners. Um, and also a case study uh, in collaboration, in, in this case, this case studies of the Lund University, so in collaboration with Lund University and the Department of Mechanical Engineering in L'Aquila uh, about the lighting control for the visual comfort. Uh, here I'm going to describe just one of these case studies about, uh, is the one that we call House in the Wood. Okay, so it's a house uh, that was equipped with sensors, thanks to our colleague, uh, colleagues from the mechanical department, uh, sensors that provided us with the measurements of room temperatures and power consumption, and also on the on-off switching of the heater the actuator. Uh, these data were collected from March to May 2016, and together with the data of the weather forecast, were used to create the data-driven models uh, to set up a, an MVC control problem with the goal of minimizing the power consumption uh, while keeping the temperature within comfort bounds. Uh, in particular, the first step was to uh, compare the, um, the quality of the identification that we have done uh, with respect to a model developed by the uh, colleagues uh, at the Mechanical Engineering Department using Energy Plus. So basically they spent like two months and a half of work, more or less, to create an Energy Plus model of the power consumption, obtaining an accuracy of the 92% in terms of uh, normalized root mean square error, and also uh, obtaining an Energy Plus model that uh, can be used uh, only for simulation and not for control. While with our approach in today's work, we obtained a model that was also slightly better in terms of accuracy, and we could use to, to set up optimal control. In particular, in terms of control performance, we compared our approach against a bang bang controller, that is the classical controller that um, we mostly found inside the houses. Uh, and over a window of 15 days, we got an energy saving of the 20, that goes from the 25% to the 50%, depending on the choice of the weight of the slack variable of the MPC problem. So deciding if we want to weight more the bound violation or the uh, energy saving. Another interesting case study is about structural monitoring that uh, we are uh, doing collaborating with the civil engineering department of University of uh, La Sapienza. And in particular, considering the topics of damage detection in structure and active control. Uh, I, I will show you a case just on this latter, in particular on a structure, a two-story frame structure that uh, was at the University of uh, Basilicata, the city of Potenza. The structure was equipped with eight accelerometers with a sampling time of 10 milliseconds and, uh, and was excited by a simulated earthquake. So the structure was equipped also with dampers, so our goal was to control dampers to compensate the earthquake acceleration. So given the uh, measurement from the accelerometer, we created um, a regression tree-based model and set up an MPC problem to uh, control the damper force. Um, and then we compared this approach to the, most, uh, to the most standard SSI identification method that is commonly used in the civil engineering community, actually. And um, this, these are the results that we obtained in terms of um, uh, accuracy, modeling accuracy. Uh, over an horizon of 0 0.2 seconds with the regression tree, uh, we were able to obtain, in terms of normalized root mean square error, a much better accuracy with respect to the um, SSI algorithm. Um, improvement that we found also in terms of control performance. In fact, on the left, you can see the plots of the displacement and the velocity of the first two floor on the structure. And the red line represents basically the displacement and velocity due to the control via regression trees. And you can see that it's uh, 
tighter than the blue line that corresponds to the SSI-based uh, controller. And also another uh, interesting result is uh, in here in the bottom right plot, uh, where we plot the cumulative kinetic energy that is transferred from the earthquake to the structure. That is the one we wanted to minimize. And in the case of regression trees, uh, con this controller, we can see that this amount of energy is, is uh, more or less the half uh, of the SSI-based method. Uh, then we compare this uh, methodology also with the case of random forest and neural networks. Uh, in particular, with neural networks, we obtained a better modeling accuracy. Uh, however, this, uh, the neural network provides some drawbacks in terms of control because neural networks provides us with uh, uh, highly nonlinear models. Okay, so um, solving a highly uh, MPC problem with a highly nonlinear model um, can be a problem for real time application when uh, where the sampling time is low, as in this case is is 10 milliseconds. So we compare the control performance between the random forest and the regression trees. And the interesting fact can be seen on the top plots. We can see on the right that um, both, uh, both controllers provided more or less the same amount of kinetic energy transferred from the uh, earthquake to the structure. But it's interesting to see on the left plot that represent the cumulative sum of square of the force applied by the dampers, uh, that with the random forest, we were able to obtain the same kinetic energy transfer with the half of the force applied by the damper. So now, while the cases I've shown up to now have been the beginning of uh, our research activity during these years, we realized that this was uh, actually a really promising research line. So we started to expand uh, to expand it, also investigating other fields as the symbol decoding in multicolor optimal uh, fibers. Since in L'Aquila, we recently got the first installation in the world of this technology and was done by um, the um, Japanese company Sumitomo. Uh, also, we started to work on power converters to reduce the peak loads and on dynamic bandwidth allocation in software defined networks without neglecting, uh, of course, theoretical uh, aspects as the stability investigation of the described methodology or the approximation of neural networks with uh, affine uh, switching models. Uh, all this in collaboration also with, with other partners. And um, to conclude, basically, as I said at the beginning, all this has been contacted in the last years within the Ingevic project. Uh, but initially, there were just me and uh, Alessandro Di Nocenzo that were working on this topic, but then the group grown up and also new projects have been, um, have been founded on this topic. So, as, for example, the Excel projects values and uh, IRL40 uh, that just started and also the Emerge project with other 5 million euros that will allow us to keep investigating in these promising directions and being open to collaboration with anyone who could be interested in these uh, topics. So thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, are there some questions? Hi, Francesco. Nice Hi. to see you. Yeah, I was in the room without the door of the... Ah, okay, okay. I see, I see. Let's see if we have some... A, a quick question. It seems not. It seems not, indeed. Okay, in the meanwhile, I would like perhaps the next <clears throat> speaker, perhaps to start sharing the screen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you again. Uh, okay, let's just wait one minute. Okay, so let's go ahead with the next contribution. The title is 
deep reinforcement learning for autonomous robot navigation in unknown environments. This is a contribution by Alessandro Devo, who is going to present this uh, contribution. Alberto Dionigi, Giacomo Mezzetti, Gabriele Costante, and Paolo Valici. Please, Alessandro, thank you. Okay, can you, can you see my screen? Yeah, we, we, okay. we do. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, um, Alessandro Devo of the uh, ISA lab group of uh, the Department of Engineering of Perugia. And today I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, deep reinforcement learning uh, techniques for autonomous navigation. Uh, let's now briefly introduce the uh, Actocritic framework, uh, which is a very common uh, uh, framework uh, used in many uh, reinforcement learning applications. So in uh, this framework, we have basically uh, three main entities, uh, which are uh, uh, the actor, the environment, and the critic. So uh, the actor is the actual algorithm that we want to uh, design. Uh, it is the one that performs the control actions uh, needed to uh, perform a particular task. So the actor, it is the one that interacts with the, uh, with the environment and collect the, the, the data uh, necessary to, uh, um, to train the, the agent. So we have the actor which uh, collects the uh, observation uh, from the environment and also uh, the environment responds with uh, um, the reward signal uh, used by the critic to uh, evaluate the quality of the uh, actor policy. So um, by collecting these trajectories of uh, observations, uh, um, actions, uh, and uh, rewards, the, uh, uh, the policy can be, uh, can be learned. So the um, main uh, function that the um, actor want to, um, want to maximize is the cumulative uh, reward, which is the sum of uh, all uh, the reward discounted by a, a factor gamma that represents the temporal uh, preferency. And so the actor want to maximize this, uh, this reward, which is designed by the, um, the engineer uh, um, and represent the, um, the quality of the policy uh, at a given task. And uh, while the, the critic uh, want to, um, as, caref as carefully as, as it can, um, estimate th this value to uh, correctly uh, evaluate the policy. To do that, the critic uh, can use uh, two functions, the uh, value functions and the uh, state action value function, uh, Q, Q function, and, um, which serves a very similar purpose, but uh, do this in a, a slightly different way. In fact, the value function uses, uh, the value function V uses only uh, the current uh, observation to evaluate the policy, while the uh, Q value function uses also the uh, current action. So um, the problem is that in uh, many uh, difficult problems, like uh, the ones, uh, um, uh, like, like for example, visual navigation, um, the, um, the value function or the key value function cannot be uh, mathematically uh, calculated exactly. So we have to uh, use uh, function approximators, like for example, uh, neural networks. Now I um, briefly discuss the two uh, case studies uh, that I will uh, discuss in this uh, um, presentation, which are uh, target-driven visual navigation, in which uh, an agent uh, um, has to explore a possibly unknown environment to reach a user-specified object uh, using only visual inputs. In this case, we, we address the problem by considering uh, uh, discrete action spaces. So the policy will produce only um, discrete actions like uh, go forward, uh, turn left, uh, and turn right, for example. And the visual active tracking task in which an agent has to actively uh, perform motion maneuvers to uh, track a moving target. In this case, we consider continuous uh, uh, actions. So the policy will output uh, um, directly the um, velocity and the, the speed and the angular speed of the, uh, of the robot. So let's talk about first uh, target driven visual navigation. For this task, we propose a, a deep neural network 
um, composed by two main components. You can see uh, on the left, the um, object localization module, uh, which take as input uh, the um, frames from the first person view of the agent and the uh, user specified image containing the target to, uh, to find. And with this information, it, uh, its task is to um, produce a, a one of vector indicating if the object of interest is in the image and if it is, um, where exactly uh, is located uh, on that image. Uh, the second network is the, um, is the uh, navigation, uh, navigation network, which take as input, uh, again, the uh, first person view of the, um, of the robot and also the output of the uh, object localization uh, module. In this case, uh, its task is to uh, explore the, um, the environment until uh, the object uh, localization model um, does not indicate that the, uh, the object of interest is in its field of view. And in, the, in that case, it has to find it and approach it. Um, as you can see, the network output both the value the value function and the policy pi. Um, this is because in this case, we choose to um, share, share the weight, um, all the weights among the, the, um, the actor and the critic. So in this case, both actor and the critic use the same uh, network. Okay, to train our agent, we build 16 separated uh, mazes in which, in which uh, we place the um, the uh, agent and its uh, target. So uh, since we want to um, design an algorithm which is deployable directly in a real uh, scenario without any kind of retraining or fine tuning in the real world, we try to address the generalization by randomizing uh, some relevant elements of the, uh, in the, of the environment, such as the textures, the maze structure, and also the uh, Latin cognition, for, it, for example. Um, we design two kinds of experiments to uh, assess the quality of the learned policy. So uh, the first one is the uh, exploration experiment in which, uh, the, um, which the agent is placed in a very large maze. And the task in this case is to explore the maze as fast as possible. Uh, in the target-driven experiment, instead, the maze is, is uh, much smaller, but uh, um, however, at the, at the end of the, of the maze, the uh, agent has also to find, uh, to recognize the target and approach it. So let's see some example of the exploration experiments. You can see on the left, uh, the first person view of the agent and uh, on the right, the top-down view of the maze. So by observing the trajectories uh, um, perform by the, performed by the uh, agent, we can see that it, uh, um, during training, it uh, implicitly learn a, a very useful, very, very robust strategy to explore unknown mazes. In fact, it uh, basically uh, just following the right wall, which, which guarantees that uh, it will, um, it will, um, which will be never lost uh, during the exploration. In the target-driven experiment, we can see again that the agent is basically follow the uh, right wall. And on the, uh, cent the, the uh, central frame, we can see the saliency map, which, uh, um, which describes uh, what are the parts of the images in, in which the uh, agent uh, is uh, uh, paying more attention. And in this case, uh, we can see the agent uh, is paying, uh, is focusing uh, on, uh, especially on the, cor the, the, um, the corners of, the, of the, the contours of the wall or the right wall as we imagined. Uh, on the right, we can see the value function produced by the critic, which uh, shows very low values in correspondence of the pens. And on the contrary, shows uh, um, high values on correspondence of, uh, of, uh, of the corners. So um, as we can see, the uh, agent has developed some uh, basic understandings of the task of, of, of unknown uh, environments. And finally, the agent reaches the, the target. 
Okay, we also conduct uh, several real experiments in the real world, both uh, indoor and outdoor in simple uh, uh, mazes. And we can see our algorithm directly deployed in, uh, uh, in a physical robot. So in this case, uh, the robot has to first explore the uh, maze, which is, uh, of course, unknown to the, to the agent. And finally, has, has to reach the, um, the specified target, which in this case is the bottle. Now let's talk about uh, visual active tracking. For this task, we again uh, propose a, a deep network uh, architectures um, composed again by convolutional uh, recurrent layers. In this case, as I said, we consider continuous, action, uh, continuous actions. So we, um, to train the model, we use the, the deep deterministic policy gradient algorithm, which is uh, specifically designed to treat, uh, um, to cope with uh, continuous action spaces. And we can see uh, in addition that this time we decided to split the network into um, distinct components. So in this case, the actor and the critic are, uh, do not share any, any weights. So in green, we can see the actor, which is paired with the current RGB frame. And uh, it produces uh, three values, the uh, estimated distance, the estimated angle, which are both used uh, to, um, to compute an auxiliary loss that uh, helps uh, the agent to learn basic concept uh, of the task. And also, of course, the uh, policy pie. The critic in yellow is uh, again fed with the uh, current uh, RGB frame, but also with the action uh, produced by the, by, the, by the actor, which is used to compute the um, Q-value function um, that is used to, to measure the quality of the, of the um, policy. So again, we, we use uh, um, several uh, um, separated uh, environments to train our agent in the simulation. And as before, we, uh, to, we, we want to um, achieve direct, uh, direct uh, um, si simulation to real world transfer. So, uh, as before, we uh, address the generalization problem by randomizing uh, various elements of the environment, like, uh, as I already said, the textures, lightning condition, uh, etc. Uh, typically, in, uh, in our reinforcement learning uh, problem, uh, we have that uh, in the first uh, uh, steps of the, of the training, uh, the policy is uh, uh, um, completely random. So the data collected in this way are usually not very useful to learn, uh, to learn the task. So uh, to mitigate this problem, we design a simple drafted algorithm that we refer to as a heuristic trajectories generator, HTG for short, that uh, um, just from the beginning uh, of the training by following a very simple, uh, very simple policy can collect the useful trajectories that, then, that are then stored together with the other generated by the, by the model. So that the model can begin to learn uh, right from the beginning. So let's see some results. We can see an image reporting the, um, the performance of our model during training, our, mod, uh, our CIVAT model. So we can see in blue that our model without uh, heuristic trajectories and without uh, the auxiliary loss cannot achieve good performances during training. And uh, instead, by using uh, the heuristic trajectories, we can see that our model, our model can quickly uh, learn very good uh, tracking policies. Uh, to test uh, um, our proposed approach, we design other um, new environments with uh, previously uh, unseen textures and compare it against uh, several ba baseline, such as uh, HTG and, and also other two uh, state-of-the-art uh, state methods, like Advert Plus uh, and uh, Active Object uh, Tracker. So let's see some qualitative um, performance. We can see uh, the first person view of the tracker and uh, that, that uh, are uh, try to follow, uh, try to track a, a simple target, which now uh, is performing circular trajectories with, with different speeds. And we can see that our agent is uh, 
uh, very capable of uh, track that target. Now we can see uh, a different target, uh, an adversarial target, which is, uh, um, which is trained uh, uh, specifically to fool the tracker. So it is uh, um, a much more difficult uh, um, uh, target. And we can see on the right the performances of the uh, ADVAT plus uh, uh, state of the art approach, which is not able, unfortunately, to, um, to track correctly the target. And on the, uh, on the left side, we can see our method that is instead able to do that. Now we can see our algorithm deployed in, the, uh, in a real settings with a real robot. So on the left, we can see the first person view of, uh, of the robot. And uh, we can also see uh, an Aruco marker, but it is not used uh, by our algorithm to track uh, the, the, um, the target, but it's it just used to take some measurement uh, to uh, evaluate uh, our performance, uh, our, our agent performances. And as you can see, the, uh, our method is also able to uh, perfectly, perfectly uh, track the target without that, uh, that marker. So to conclude, our algorithm is able to be deployed in a, uh, in a real world and to uh, properly track a specified target also with uh, some dynamic and distracting uh, elements in the, in the background. Thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. I see a question in, in the chat by Luca Ballotta. I don't know if you can see it. Um, so the question is, okay. uh, please, Luca, go ahead. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I just, I just would like to know how is the, uh, the, the saliency map in the, um, I think, uh, in the simulated part of the first set of experiments computed. Uh, I understand that this saliency map is to um, is for us to understand how the robot is evaluating the environment and uh, uh, what is uh, focusing on. Uh, but in particular, I would like to understand how it's actually computed. Okay, I, okay. Um... The saliency map is computed by um, showing, uh, by computing the gradients on the, uh, between, uh, I mean, you, you can compute the gradient from the uh, output to the action uh, from back, back to the input image. The, the feature extracted by the convolutional network from the input image. So basically, you can see that uh, if the gradient is very high with respect to a, um, a um, specific, uh, um, specific pixel, a specific set of pixel of the image, you can uh, understand that uh, this is a very important uh, part for the, for, the, for the algorithm. So you can see in, in, uh, in black the, area, the, the areas with the, um, with the lowest gradient in which, uh, um, which, which the agent uh, basically is just discarding. And uh, in, uh, in, in the, uh, I mean, in the, in, the transparent, uh, in the transparent mask, you can see instead the, the, um, the set of pixels in which uh, the, the gradient is, uh, is stronger. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Alessandro. Are there some yes. other questions? It seems not. In the meanwhile, I ask Domenico to start sharing the screen. Yeah. Okay. okay, let's let's just wait for one minute. Okay. Okay, so let's start with the last contribution 
that is entitled a Q learning approach for soft ECU design in um, automotive vehicles. This is a contribution by um, Domenico Natella and Francesco Frasca. Please, Domenico. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Domenico Natella and I'm a PhD student from uh, the University of Sanio. I'm going to present a uh, work entitled uh, A Q Learning Approach for Soft ECU Design in uh, Automotive Vehicles. Uh, in next slides, uh, I will give you a brief introduction about the problem and the proposed uh, solution. Afterward, just some technicalities uh, to understand the problem formulation and consequently uh, application to automotive vehicles. Uh, I will also present uh, the design phase characterized by the Q-learning algorithm uh, as already mentioned uh, in the title, then some results uh, and finally the conclusions. In control theory, reinforcement learning techniques uh, has been uh, widely used. And uh, for instance, uh, reinforcement learning uh, has be been proposed uh, for the design of controllers uh, uh, also so-called agents, which must take uh, actions applied to an unknown environment by maximizing uh, a cumulative reward. And uh, uh, reinforcement learning is also generally applied for the solution of uh, optimal tracking control problems. Uh, a possible technique for evaluating the quality of the agent's action is the so-called uh, Q-learning approach. And the use of Q-learning for the design of software electronic control units is proposed and applied uh, to automotive vehicle. Uh, generally speaking, in the presence of many uh, issues, uh, that is a quite common architecture in our uh, automotive vehicles, the computational load of the uh, software in the loop or hardware in the loop model could become a real uh, important challenge to overcome. And uh, this simulation environment, uh, software in the loop and hardware in the loop is uh, important, uh, generally speaking, during validation and uh, uh, software testing. A possible solution uh, to, um, to overcome the computational load uh, consists in using uh, soft issues, uh, which uh, emulate uh, the code of uh, some issues, uh, electronic control units, with the aim of reducing the overall computation load of the numerical tests without compromising uh, the uh, functionalities of interest involved in the interaction with the other issues. Uh, it's important to do these things because a real issue involved in uh, uh, during the test uh, can recognize a fake issue and that fake uh, issue uh, can introduce in real issue diagnostic trouble codes. Uh, the reinforcement learning technique uh, can be described as a process where an agent uh, take uh, actions applied to an environment to control it and maximize a cumulative reward. Uh, the interaction between the agent and the environment is modeled as a Markov decision process. And this can be defined as a quadruple where uh, uh, S is the state of, uh, is the set of the states. Uh, a of S is the set of uh, actions with uh, which the agent uh, uh, can take given the state, and R is the possible uh, rewards. Uh, furthermore, P is the probability of transitioning to state S prime, given that the environment is uh, in the state S, and the agent takes an action A. Uh, the control policy uh, PSA uh, is defined as the probability to take uh, the action A of S given a state S. Uh, S. 
Uh, the reinforcement learning technique uh, uh, involves uh, the evaluation of a value function uh, in order to estimate how good uh, is to perform an action A of S. Uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, the value function J under a policy pi can be formulated as the expected return in the future time interval when starting from a state uh, uh, S and following the policy uh, pi. Then the optimal policy uh, at uh, the time t uh, from the state uh, S t is the policy corresponding to the largest value function, uh, as mentioned in the slide uh, as, uh, with uh, J star. Hence, the quality function, Q star, also called the action uh, value function, is defined as the expected return of the end when the optimal policy is followed thereafter. Uh, other things to be noticed is uh, uh, PSS prime A is the probability of the transition from the state S to S prime, given the action A, and the row is the expected value of the reward RT starting from the state S applying action A and go, going to the state ST plus one. Uh, a soft issue, as uh, already mentioned, is a simplified version of, uh, corresponding, of the corresponding real uh, issue and the simpler code of the soft issue must emulate the supervisory and control algorithms implemented in the real issue installed, physically installed in the vehicle. Uh, obviously, uh, you have to respect a satisfactory level of accuracy. Uh, the goal of this simplification is to reduce the computational load of, the, of an hardware in the loop environment. And by using the reinforcement learning technology, the architecture, uh, as uh, uh, shown in the slide, is uh, divided in two subsystems, the agent, and uh, that is basically soft issue, while the environment consists in the combination of uh, the vehicle model and the issue to be emulated. Uh, obviously, also in our case, uh, the, uh, the issue can be uh, real, such as in the case of hardware in the loop scheme or simulated, uh, so as in the case of a uh, uh, software in the loop numerical testing procedure. Uh, the vehicle block in the figure uh, includes the, el uh, the algorithms implemented by other issues involved, and also the um, sensor reading and so on. Uh, the software issue uh, receives the information about the state of the, the vehicle at uh, each timestamp, and the output of the soft issue is an action which belongs to the set of possible action from that state. Uh, the actions of the soft issue influence the uh, time evolution of the vehicle, uh, the vehicle uh, as it is shown in the, in the figure. And uh, um, uh, the, this is the basic idea for, for, the proposed, for our proposed approach. Indeed, during the training phase, uh, the soft issue may not provide the expected good action, that is the one uh, which would be generated by the real issue in the same operating conditions. Uh, the rewards evaluate the goodness of the action taken by the soft issue and uh, is given by the opposite of the absolute value of the error between the good action generated by the issue and those proposed by the soft issue. Uh, a standard Q learning algorithm is used to implement the iteration process for maximizing the evaluation capability of the soft issue with respect to the real issue. And the proposed approach is described by uh, the standard, uh, as I said, uh, um, pseudocode reported in the algorithm. The training phase consists of a sequence of several uh, episodes. Each episode is a real driving cycle. 
each one has a uh, duration, uh, um, fixed duration. New episodes are activated until the average reward uh, becomes larger than uh, a fixed uh, threshold. And uh, at the beginning of each episode, the Q function is uh, initialized uh, of for all state action pairs to the corresponding values uh, obtained at the end of previous episodes. Uh, for each episode at each time step, the current state uh, ST and the reward RT are obtained from the uh, environment, as I said before. The algorithms updated uh, the Q function by applying the equation uh, seen uh, before. Uh, for the pair uh, C, uh, S T minus one and A T minus one. Uh, and by not updating the other uh, uh, state action pairs uh, just for uh, uh, reduct uh, time uh, computation. Then the value of the average reward is updated by including uh, the new reward uh, sample. Uh, the algorithm uh, provides uh, the computation of all the action to be applied. And uh, first, uh, the action Mx, uh, which maximizes the Q function, is determined. And then, in order the, to ensure uh, the uh, exploration feature, Mx is uh, chosen just with a probability 1 minus P uh, epsilon. Uh, while a random action different from A max is taken with the probability P epsilon. The parameter P epsilon is updated according to the epsilon greedy uh, exploration, which is a part of the uh, learning algorithm. And P epsilon is decreased after each episode by a suitable decaying rate. Uh, in our algorithm, that decaying uh, decay rate is theta. Uh, obviously, uh, our, uh, our application is uh, a real application made in a real car, and it is assumed that the computation time required for uh, uh, the uh, action in the algorithm is much smaller than the sampling period of the control loop. Uh, the training scenario scenario consists in, a, uh, in considering the uh, NG speed and the gas pedal position for the vehicle uh, as the state, and the action uh, generated by the soft TCU is the torque request, request by the uh, driver. The validation phase is characterized by the absence of the real issue in the control loop. In particular, in each time step, the soft issue selects the action which must maximize the Q function. An alternative approach for the validation phase would be not considered a new reward based on the error with respect to some nominal performance given by the, uh, the, ve the vehicle, uh, I don't know, probably the uh, fuel consumption. Uh, here is shown the experimental setup to acquire the data coming from uh, the single real ECU physically installed in the vehicle. Uh, everything uh, seen before uh, uh, about uh, um, the validation, the, the training phase uh, cannot be applied to a real vehicle because during uh, the training phase, you cannot think that uh, uh, the vehicle can give a random commands uh, to the internal combustion engine in a real, in a real context, uh, just for your security. Because uh, if you want to stop the car, probably the soft ECU during the training wants to accelerate and it cannot possible in a real context. Uh, in this case, in fact, we acquired the data coming from the whole vehicle and then uh, use that data in a simulation context uh, using MATLAB simulating environment. Uh, in this slide, you can see some uh, results. On the left, episodes reward during the training phase in the first scenario. As I said before, it should be noted that uh, the soft ECU is not connected to a vehicle, but in an hardware in the loop environment, one can think to connect directly 
the soft PCU with the aim of exploring condition which might not be activated when the standard uh, ECU is uh, uh, feedback is uh, considered. Uh, the reward uh, reaches a uh, quasi state, uh, steady state uh, um, after uh, 4,000 episodes, in which the epsilon greedy parameter is equal to 0 0.1. Uh, the result show a good, shows a good uh, mat matching of the soft issue uh, torque request with those of the uh, real issue. In particular, the soft issue does not assume uh, the same value of the uh, issue for torque request when the engine, uh, the, the, the issue mode, changed due to a major variation of the shape of the driving cycle. Obviously, that one is not a standard driving cycle for uh, who is an uh, expert in automotive field, uh, is not VLTP or uh, NEDC, but, but it is a real driving cycle. A Q learning approach for the uh, design of the soft issue in a conventional, uh, conventional automotive vehicle has been proposed with uh, some good uh, results. And uh, obviously the idea uh, seems to be transferable to other application areas where uh, software in the loop and hardware in the loop techniques are used for uh, issues rapid prototyping. Uh, future work is aimed to at testing the soft uh, ECU design procedure for a more complex, uh, uh, for example, hybrid electric vehicles in a real time scenario. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Domenico, for your nice presentation. Let's see if we have some questions. Um, well, it seems that there are no more, no questions from this contribution. So um, this session is going to end now. I would like to thank all the contributors to, um, to this session and also all the attendees. And uh, let's see next contributions in this very interesting conference of the CIDRA. Goodbye to everybody.